Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Hello, Martin. Are we kicking off some interesting things again today? Well, there are so many problems surrounding this subject and so many misunderstandings. And, you know, sometimes one has to do a thing three, four, five, six, seven times, and then we still don't understand it. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. let's see where we can get with this one. Okay, so I'll open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are here once again, and we ask that you please help us, enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit, and bless the discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, Martin, again, we are talking about Bibles. And it's a very sensitive subject with very emotional attachments. And some people are uh, so adamant about one side or the other side uh, that this will lead to a holy war. <laughs> <laughs> True. And it, it shows you how important it is that you, you were even banned in a country yes. because of it, yes. speaking, speaking. And yeah, you see, and it's also necessary that we again look at this and hopefully we can do a thorough one and explain it to people because sometimes even what we say don't seem to come through like we mean it. Okay. Sometimes people misunderstand what is being said and uh, that is a problem. So we've titled it, The Truth Will Set You Free. And John 8 verse 32 is the verse that comes to mind then, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's a very important aspect, right? Mm -hmm. You have to know the truth, and once you know the truth, the truth will make you free. If you want to accept and internalize this very important statement here in this verse, isn't it imperative that you know what truth is? Exactly. Hmm? You must know what truth is. Yeah. Because only the truth can make you free. So if you don't know the truth, you're in bondage. Perfect. Hmm? Because it's the same, like you said, if you tell people to come out of Babylon, but you don't define Babylon, it's, it's, it the, doesn't have any meaning. No. So if you don't know what the truth is, or you think you know what it is... Then you're in trouble if, you don't, if you're not in the truth, but you think you're in the truth. Mm -hmm. So we must know what truth is. Now, do you think that the devil is the enemy of truth? Yes. He's yeah, a liar from the beginning, right? He's the father of lies. So definitely he doesn't like truth. No. So we've defined truth in this whole series, I mean, so many times. It's unbelievable. But let's go in a little bit more detail just to see where we stand. And you know, Martin, this issue of truth causes consternation and conflict at every level. It causes conflict with the secular world, mm -hmm. it causes conflict with the religious world, and it causes conflict even within the same denominations, including our own. Yeah. Hmm? So it must be a very big issue. Definitely. And also, you mentioned now that the Satan is op opposed to truth. He hates truth yes. with a passion. But then all his agents will also have to be opposed to it. Absolutely. All right. So let's have a look what the papacy says about truth. Now, according to the scripture, it's very important that you know the truth because otherwise you're in bondage, mm -hmm. right? So Pope Francis says, and this is again from the Jesuit Review, it seems like that is one of our favorite journals. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a positive no, sense. No. no. Pope Francis, those who insist on keeping the truth over preaching the gospel have always threatened the church. That's a very strange statement to make, right? Yeah. Now tell me, Martin, is there a difference between the gospel and the truth? And they can't be. And in, <laughs> you know, that's so um, ridiculous. It's a saying that this pot is here, but it's not containing the flowers. All right. <laughs> now, if you say the gospel, the word gospel means good news, right? Yeah. 
Now, the good news is that you're no longer going to be in bondage, but you're going to be set free. What was the thing that was going to set you free? The truth. All right, so keeping the truth <laughs> is not important. This is amazing. I, I don't even want to read it all. But, you know, they have these little statements like keepers of the truth, they call themselves. Now, are there keepers of the lie? Yes. Hmm? yes. I wonder who's the keeper of the lie on this planet. Now, if they talk derogatory about the keeper of the truth, Satan's job was to keep uh, the, com the truth, to protect the commandments. He was a covering cherub, yes. So yeah. that sounds sim similar to what he would be saying about derogatory talking over people keeping the truth. All right. Then uh, he talks about these Christians that claim that they're keeping the truth, and they strongly affirm that the true Christianity is the one they adhere to, often identified with certain forms of the past, and that the solution to the crisis of today is to go back so as not to lose the genuineness of the faith. He's obviously talking about the Reformation in couch terms. Because uh, they're quoting the Pope, right? So he's saying, let's not go back to Reformation times when these people say, Thy word is truth! Mm -hmm. And we must stick to the truth, so therefore we must stick to the Bible. No, 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 we've, come, we've, we've passed that now. We're now with uh, our variant of the truth, which happens to be a lie. Hmm? And that's true. Okay. So one of the traces of this way of proceeding is inflexibility. Mm. Now, Martin, how flexible can you be when it comes to Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation? There's no way you can be any flexible. Must you become inflexible? Mm. Now, how, you do you, to how do you deal with the, the other major religions on the planet that deny that Jesus is the only way that we can come to the Father. You have to get rid of him. So you have to become flexible. Mm -hmm. hmm. So you must sacrifice truth for fraternity. That's it. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So this inflexibility, as he calls it, is a bane, is a enemy in his eyes. Yeah. So th you have to become so flexible that this brotherly love, this love your neighbor, can go over Jesus Christ. So you must become a rubber man. Hmm. Now, you know, in the old days they called the rubber man spineless. Faced with the preaching of the gospel that makes us free. Ah, but Martin, the preaching of the gospel makes us free. Now the question is, which gospel makes us free? The true gospel. Okay, now what did Jesus say makes us free? The truth. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, we're back at that. Uh, we're in trouble. We're in trouble here, right? Okay. That makes us joyful. What makes us joyful? That you're free from what? From the bondage of truth. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that's what he's saying. Yeah, that's exactly. Okay. These people are rigid. Always the rigidity. You must do this. You must do that. Inflexibility is typical of these people. Now, Martin, when it comes to the position of Christ as the mediator of the covenant, mm -hmm. as the savior of the world, as the righteousness of the saints, uh, is there any leeway for flexibility? No, not at all. And even if you go to the other part of truth, which is the law, can you have a flexibility on thou shalt not steal? Well, according to Thomas Aquinas, yes. yes. And he's see. a saint according to them. So then you can see by their fruits where, they, where it leads you. All right. So the new preachers do not know what humility is. And here's that famous word of his, fraternity. Now that document that he wrote about fraternity was signed by another major religion in the world that denies that Jesus is the only way. Mm -hmm. Right? That's it. That's flexibility, but is it truth? Not at all. Not according to the Bible definition. No. Okay. So this flexibility and this fraternity 
It is the path of meek and obedient trust. The new preachers know neither meekness nor obedience. Obedience to whom? That's the question. Because who defines that obedience and meekness? Not the Bible. Obviously he does, right? Yes. He's very cheerful over there. And he has great plans for fraternity at the cost of truth. Mm -hmm. So this is a very serious issue. To come up with something well, like that, I'm afraid you have to be a Jesuit. Let me go to our own church. This is a uh, statement that was made by the General Conference President Robert Pearson when he addressed the General Conference for the last time in his capacity as the President of the General Conference in 1978. Just to show that some of these issues can even find their way into our own ranks. I'm not going to read the whole document because it's rather lengthy. We can put a link in. So we'll summarize some of it and read some of it. An earnest appeal from the retiring president of the General Conference presented to Annual Council on October 15, 1978. Quote, This will be the last time that in my present role I shall stand before the world leaders of my church, your church, our church. And I have a few words to leave with you. Elder Pearson then proceeds to describe how a church can become complacent and lose its compass once it had passed from the sectarian image to a fully accepted church status with worldly accreditation. So worldly accreditation becomes a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, to be accepted by the world. Yes. And then he states, Brethren and sisters, this must never happen to the Seventh-day Adventist church. This will not happen to the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is not just another church. It is God's church. Mm. So it's, a, in an, it's an appeal. It shouldn't happen. Why did he do this? Mm. Because it was already happening, right? He said, already, brethren and sisters, there are subtle forces that are beginning to stir, regrettably. There are those in the church who belittle the inspiration of the Bible. Martin, is that fighting against truth? Yes. Okay. Where are these people? Regrettably, there are those in the church who belittle the inspiration of the Bible, who scorn the first 11 chapters of Genesis, who question the spirit of prophecy's short chronology of the earth. Now, Martin, we've dealt with that many times, and we seem to be facing this war over and over because already then they were fighting against the short chronology. They seem to have perfected it right now and seem to be at war with anybody who adheres to it. Yeah. All right, so the short chronology of the earth and who subtly and not so subtly attack the spirit of prophecy. There are some who point to the reformers and contemporary theologians as a source and the norm for Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. So some of them love the higher critics and seem to run along with them and embrace what they have to say. There are those who allegedly are tired of the hackneyed phrases of Adventism. There are those who wish to forget the standard of the church we love. That includes things like health reform, dress reform, etc. There are those who covet and would court the favor of the evangelicals. Evan evangelical movements, ecumenism, mm -hmm. all of these things. Those who would throw off the mantle of a peculiar people and those who would go the way of the secular materialistic world. Fellow leaders, beloved brethren and sisters, don't let it happen. I appeal to you as earnestly as I know how this morning. Don't let it happen. Martin, is it happening? It has happened and it's still happening. Okay. Are we often in the middle of this war? I appeal to Andrews University, to the seminary, to Loma Linda University. Don't let it happen. We are not Seventh-day Anglicans, not Seventh-day Lutherans. We are Seventh-day Adventists. This is God's last church with God's last message. 
So this war is raging, and uh, people will have to decide one way or the other. And truth is involved. Mm -hmm. Inspiration of the Bible is involved. Short chronology is involved. Spirit of prophecy is involved. Any one of these issues, ecumenism is involved. Accreditation is involved. All of these issues. Yes. And if you get trapped into any of them, can you be torn away from truth? That's exactly what happens. He continued, You are the men and women, the leaders whom God is counting on to keep the Seventh-day Adventist Church God's remnant church, the church God has destined to triumph. The servant of the Lord says, Fearful perils are before those who bear responsibilities in the Lord's work. Perils, the thought of which make me tremble. And in Ezekiel 22, 30, we read, I looked for a man amongst them who could build a barricade, who could stand before me in the breach to defend the land from ruin. I believe this morning, fellow leaders, that God is looking for men and women, intrepid leaders, men and women, who love God's church and God's truth more than they love their lives. To see that this church under God goes through to the kingdom. The task ahead of us is not going to be easy. If I understand the Bible and the spirit of prophecy aright this morning, ahead lies a time of trouble. A time of challenge such as this church and this world have never before known. We've entered the precursors to this time. And anybody that wants to say the contrary... I don't know on which planet you're living. Well, Martin, let's go back to this definition in the Bible of truth, which we have discussed so many times already. And let's just look at it in the light of what we are discussing now. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. This single statement, is the most controversial statement in the Bible. It is by itself responsible for the destruction and war between factions on this earth, such as we will never understand until the books of record are opened. Hmm? How many millions and millions have lost their lives because of that single statement? Probably most wars link back to this so maybe some people will say oh, why god did you put it in there <laughs> because if it's not in there you no longer will have the truth exactly right and i just wanted to say because all truth hangs on this verse okay here's the truth i'm the way the truth and the life no man comes unto the father but by me okay does islam embrace this verse does Buddhism embrace it? No. Does Hinduism embrace it? No. Does Shamanism embrace it? Does Zoroastrianism mm -hmm. embrace it? Does the New Age movement embrace it? No. Does Catholicism embrace it? No, no they not. believe in fraternity. Mm -hmm. So who embraces it? Only the people that keep the truth. The fanatics, the yeah. rigid ones exactly. that have no, that, that should become spineless, right? according to uh, the gentleman in the Vatican. All right, so Jesus is the way and the truth. The second definition is sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's interesting that Jesus is also the word. That's so exactly. you cannot divorce the word yeah. from Jesus. So if you take away Jesus, then you've got no truth because you don't have a word. <laughs> you <don't laughs> Whose word do you have then? Anybody's, right? Mm. Could you then change it? Yes. Ah. That's how they do it. Isn't that interesting? So if you take away the first one, then you can change the word. But that's the same with the commandment. If you take the authority who is Jesus in the fourth commandment away, then you can do what you want with the rest of the commandments. All right. So anybody who tampers with the word is tampering with the truth and therefore is tampering with Jesus. Mm. Because it's also called the testimony of Jesus, That's it. which is the spirit of prophecy. prophecy. Mm. So where does that come from? Jesus again. Okay, so we're in trouble over here, Martin. 
I, I hope that you realize that in this, in this war, uh, the spineless fraternity attitude at all costs is a problem. Rigidity is absolutely necessary for salvation. Mm -hmm. hmm? I don't think the Vatican will like that statement. No, no. they say that that's a, the problem with the world and has been. Yes. And then the next one is Psalms 119. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Or verse 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. So those are the definitions of truth. Jesus is the truth. The word is the truth. The law is the truth. The commandments to be quite specific. So let's have a look at the first one. Now, Martin, we are in trouble no matter what we say. We're going to get it from all sides, mm -hmm. even from within. Hmm? That's Well, the Bible also says that it will happen, and the spirit of prophecy makes it clear. So we'll have to, if you want to uphold truth, you have to expect to get. The stone that was rejected became the capstone. Do not think that I have come to bring peace. peace. But there will be division, right? Is it? Okay. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a brilliant way of putting it. Because you've encapsulated Christ as the Word. Yeah. And you have declared Him to be God. Exactly. And from everlasting. In mm -hmm. the beginning was mm -hmm. God was the word. Now when the Jehovah's Witness Bible came out and they changed this verse on the basis of Westcott and Hort and some Jesuit scholars uh, to a God with a lowercase g, there was a big furor. And they only made a couple of changes. If they were to look at the scriptures today and the changes that have been made in modern translations, I think uh, those old pioneers would be spinning in their graves. But you know, time has its way of covering up that which was very plain once to become very obscure today. Mm, that's true. All right. What about John 14, verse 6? Jesus said unto him, Them I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's just read that again because this is a key verse. And here's a statement from Letters and Manuscripts. Christ is God as well as man. That's pretty straightforward. He who was with the Father before the world was became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We may behold his glory. And the glory is his character. Those who receive the Son of God become sons of God. They are his spiritual children, born again, renewed in righteousness and true holiness. Their minds are changed. With clearer vision they behold eternal realities. They are adopted into God's family and they become conformed into his likeness. Changed by his Spirit from glory to glory. From cherishing supreme love for self, they come to cherish supreme love for God and for Christ. Okay? So the opening statement, Christ is God as well as man. What would the Quran do with that? No, throw it away. We have a serious problem with yeah. it, right? Here's another quote from Manuscripts 101. He was equal with God infinite and omnipotent. He is the eternal self-existent Son. A very important statement. So he's from all eternity and he's self-existent. Mm -hmm. He wasn't created. No, he cannot be. He wasn't generated. No. He is the eternal self-existent Son. A very complex idea mm -hmm. to grapple with. Another statement from the Review and Herald, April 5, 1906, from Everlasting. 
While God's word speaks of the humanity of Christ when upon this earth, it also speaks decidedly regarding his pre-existence. The word existed as a divine being, even as the eternal Son of God, in union and oneness with his Father. From everlasting he was the mediator of the covenant, the one in whom all nations of the earth, both Jews and Gentiles, if they accepted him, Conditional. Yeah. A word to be blessed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Before men or angels were created, the Word was with God and was God. That's just echoing what John said in his mm -hmm. opening statement. All right, let's just pick it up in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That's also a beautiful statement in Scripture. And if we discuss this statement, there's a discussion of this very statement in the Review and Herald, 1907. And it says, Here the position of Jesus Christ in reference to his Father is brought to view. While they are one in purpose, one in mind, yet in personality, they are two. May we not learn from this that there is to be a unity between believers? It's an interesting point, right? Mm. So if there is unity between the Father and the Son, then there should be a possibility of union between us if our thinking is based on truth. Correct. Even though we have different personalities. Yes. May we not learn from this that there is to be unity between believers? There's no reason why one should feel that it is necessary for him to bring others to the exact line of his own individuality. So long as we are subject to the temptations of Satan, we shall each have all we can possibly attend to in order to maintain a right relation to God that Christ may do for us his atoning work. And though we may differ in the form of words and in the expression of our individuality, yes, our words may be sanctified and our characters purified through the sacrifice of Christ. So we need to be of one mind. Mm -hmm. How do you come to be in one mind? You have to have the same basis the uh, same anchor ah you must you must stand on the same foundation mm. so your personality is different because we're individuals and nobody ever asks you and god does not require of you to give up your personality mm. but your knowledge of what truth is must be based on a very solid foundation yes. okay now let's bring the Holy Spirit into this. The comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Now, Martin, anyone who wants to argue the point has to argue not only with Scripture, which says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
or they would have to argue with this statement. But please, don't argue with you or with me on the issue. This is what it says. That's it. And, they, and that's what the scriptures say. Hmm. I, I can maybe just mention there is some dispute about these statements yes. and them being not from the Spirit, Alan White herself. But I will we'll attach a document that uh, the um, Ellen White estate made, and there is her uh, own handwriting. And there's quite a few statements that has exactly this. Yes, so we cannot dispute that it is in her original handwriting. And by the way, it's what the scripture says. It's exactly, that's what the scripture says. The pre existent, self existent Son of God. The article in the Signs of Times, Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. In speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there never was a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. He whose voice the Jews were then listening had been with God as one brought up with him. He was equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. He is the eternal self-existent Son. So there was never a time when he was not. No. And it's sad that you want to downgrade Jesus. If, you, if there's an effort to downgrade Jesus, then the whole plan of salvation falls apart. So let's just make this quite clear, because this is a very controversial issue. Let's take a look at the Catholic view of Christ. Catholicism claims that Christ is generated. And uh, here is the webpage, www.catholic.com. And these are the points. The Father actively and eternally generates the Son. That contradicts what we've just read. Exactly, because he's self-existent and everlasting, and have been from everlasting. All right, so they claim that the Father actively and eternally generates the Son, constituting the person of God the Father. So the Father was there, he generated the Son. This is Catholic thinking. Catholic thinking. The Son is passively generated of the Father, which constitutes the person of the Son. So they are making Christ, in a sense, a generated being. Point number three, the Father and the Son actively spirate the Holy Spirit in the one relation within the inner life of God that does not constitute a person. It does not do so because the Father and the Son are already constituted as persons in relation to each other in the first two relations. This is why the Catholic Catechism 240 teaches that the second person of the Blessed Trinity is the Son only in relation to his Father. So the Holy Spirit, according to Catholicism, was spirated. That comes from the word breath. So, in other words, Jesus breathed, the Father breathed, and this spirated the Holy Spirit. So, in the sense, the Holy Spirit also is not a separate person or entity. It is a consequence of spiration. Fourth point, the Holy Spirit is passively spirated of the Father and the Son, constituting the person of the Holy Spirit. So, in actual fact, the only true God is the Father who generates the Son, who together spirate the Holy Spirit. That is Catholic, Catholic doctrine. That's Catholic Trinity doctrine. Yes. All right, they continue. We should take note of the distinction between the generative procession that constitutes the Son and the spirated procession that constitutes the Holy Spirit. As I find it so hard to say this, but it says there in the document, Saint Thomas Aquinas. So let's read it as it says, even if it is hard to read it that way. 
As St. Thomas Aquinas explains, and Scripture reveals the Son is uniquely begotten of the Father, they quote John, he is also said to proceed from the Father as the Word in John 1 verse 1. But in 1 verse 1, it doesn't, say that. It doesn't say that. It says he was with God. He yes. Came from. Now, when it says, I came from the Father, the word that the Bible uses is para, mm -hmm. from which we get the word parallel, means from the side of, not in the sense of coming out of. Yes, not like Eve was f from made from the rib. It's not the same word. So this generative procession is one of begetting, but not in the same way a dog begets a dog or a human being begets a human being. This is an intellectual begetting, and fittingly so, as a word proceeds from the knower while at the same time remaining in the knower. Now, Martin, this deprives Christ of being the actual word. He is in this only the word in as far as he proceeds out of the Father. Mm -hmm. So it actually denies the individuality, yes. the absolute individuality of Christ as the Son. Thus this procession of or begetting of the Son occurs within the inner life of God. There are not two beings involved, rather two persons rationally distinct while ever remaining one in being. Now, what you have there is a multi-headed God. Mm. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, but not in a generative sense, rather in a spiration. Spiration comes from the Latin word for spirit or breath. Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, John 20, verse 22. So this is Catholic doctrine. And many in the Protestant world have internalized this rather than what the scriptures say, supported also by what the spirit of prophecy has to say. Yes. So modern Catholicism believes that Jesus was generated. Hmm? So let's just look at a, a verse where this becomes a very interesting point. If you go to Matthew 1 verse 18, Gnostic writers have changed just one letter in the Greek to make Christ a created being, whose origin started at his birth. This perversion is found only in the following manuscripts. P1, the Sinaiticus, the Vaticanus, six majuscules, and a few minuscules. Almost all the modern translations don't dare to include this perversion, but follow the received text, the TR, rather than their preferred most ancient manuscripts, as they like to call them. But of course, the Jesuit-inspired Douay Bible shows no such sensibilities. Let's show it. You see, that's for me a very interesting uh, occurrence. So they, the new translations, they keep on telling you we have to go with those manuscripts, but on this issue, they'll use the received text. Yes, because they know that they will get into trouble with the Christian world. So Yes, so they're not very true to their own conviction. Absolutely correct. So let's look at it, Martin. Matthew 1, verse 18. King James Version. Received text, right? Now the birth of Jesus Christ, and the Greek there is Genesis, was in this wise, when his mother Mary had, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, Matthew 1 verse 18 in the Douay version just changes one letter. Now the generation, can you see it? Catholic doctrine of Christ, Greek for that would be Genesis. So they leave out one end. And it changes the entire meaning. Was in this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Martin, they've changed one letter. And they've changed the entire existence 
of Jesus Christ and removed his pre-existence. It's a sad isn't, state of affairs. Isn't that a sad, sad state of affairs? Contrary to the great cloud of witnesses out there that even the translators of the modern Bibles don't dare include this. Let's have a look at another one. The equality of the Son with the Father. 1 Timothy 3.16 Nestle Alant renders God was manifest in the flesh as he was manifest in the flesh. So you'll find the modern translations which follow the Nestle Alant directives will change this verse to he was manifest. So this rendition is based on five majuscles among which the Sinaiticus is the prime exhibit, and a few minuscules, thus excluding the great cloud of witnesses to the contrary. So this opens the way for Jesus to be just a created being as Gnosis would have it, and as official Catholic doctrine implies. So the NIV follows the NA by translating it, He was manifest. And in 1 Timothy 6, 14 and 15, there's another very interesting change. Let's just read it in the King James Version. First, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the King James Version. Now read it very carefully. Shall we read it again, Martin? Mm. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, in context, who is the verse talking about? Jesus Christ. Okay. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings. Who is it talking about? Jesus Christ. And Lord of Lords, who's it talking about? Still. Jesus All right. Christ. So in the context, this verse deals with Jesus Christ, with the Son. Let's read it in the NIV. To keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same mm -hmm. to this point. But now which God will bring about in his own time, dash, God, the blessed and only ruler, king of kings and lord of lords. All right, so in their context, it is possible that these verses can now refer to the Father. But the title king of kings uniquely belongs to Christ in the New Testament, and so it is rendered in the King James. However, the NIV uh, adds the word God twice in verse 15, although it does not appear in the original, so that Jesus is deprived of his place and title in these verses. So this is a serious issue. This is exactly where the doctrine then comes from that he's a created being. So is this, is this an attempt to sneak in Catholic doctrine? Yes. Would you say so? Mm -hmm. I would think so. I would think so. All right, let's leave the discussion there when it comes to, to Jesus. Obviously, according to the Bible, Jesus was there from the beginning. It's a very difficult concept to understand. Yeah, but, but that is what the Scripture says. And he is equal with the Father, para, from the side of the Father, eternally one in mind with the Father, but two beings, and the Holy Spirit is part of that heavenly trio. That's it. And That's what the Bible teaches. They've all got teaches. their purpose and they've all got their... And Jesus, if you want to make him any less than you've ju we've ju the Bible is telling us, then he couldn't have come to save our, uh, us from sin. Martin, let's look at the second aspect of truth. The Word is truth. Mm. Now when we talk about the Word, we speak about the whole Bible, right? So this could be quite a lengthy process. So let's try and make us as painless as possible. When God's word is studied, comprehended and obeyed, a bright light will be reflected to the world. New truths received and acted upon will bind us in strong bonds to Jesus. 
What binds us to Jesus? The truth. Truth. Where do I discover it? In the Bible, in the Word. And when I believe it, I'm showing that I believe God mm -hmm. and not the serpent. Didn't the serpent say, did God really say? Exactly. And then twist his words? Yep. Hmm? Yeah. So is it possible that that same serpent will say, did God really say? Mm. And then change the manuscript to say something else? Yes. Is it possible? It is possible. And then all that follow on there will do the exact same. The, okay. All the translations. The Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed, the sole bond of union. All who bow to this holy word will be in harmony. Martin, is it important that we have the right holy word? If we want to be in harmony, yes. Okay. If we want to be in harmony in truth. Our own views and ideas must not control our efforts. Man is fallible, but God's word is infallible. Instead of wrangling with one another, let men exalt the Lord. Let us meet all opposition as did our master, saying, It is written. Let us lift up the banner on which is inscribed the Bible, our rule of faith and discipline. It's very important that I know what the Bible says. And it's very important that I have a Bible that says what God said. Correct. Now, let's just see if it's possible to confuse this issue. And we've dealt with this many times, but let's put it there again for clarity. The Valdor churches, that's the Valdenses, in their purity and simplicity, resembled the church of the apostolic times. Rejecting the supremacy of Pope and prelate, they held the Bible as the only supreme infallible authority. Their pastors, unlike the lordly priests of Rome, followed the example of their master, who came not to be ministered to unto, but to minister. They fed the flock of God, leading them to green pastures and living fountains of his holy word. Far from the monuments of human pomp and pride, the people assembled not in magnificent churches or grand cathedrals, but beneath the shadow of the mountains of the alpine valleys, or in times of danger in some rocky stronghold to listen to the words of truth from the servants of Christ. Pastors not only preached the gospel, but they visited the sick, catechized the children, admonished the erring, labored to settle disputes and promote harmony and brotherly love. In times of peace, they were sustained by the free will offerings of the people, but like Paul, the tent maker, each learned some trade or profession by which, if necessary, to provide for his own support. Now, according to the spirit of prophecy, they were the true custodians of the real, true word of God. Mm -hmm. hmm? That's it. And basically. not the proud hierarchy in Rome. So there were two sets of manuscripts. That. Now, the modern Bible versions differ from the received text, which the Valdenses had and which the church in the East had, which the Byzantine church had, and which the reformers gave to the world. See, so it comes from before the Reformation. Yes. So this saying that the received text is only from the 1520s. And let's make it quite plain. The original manuscripts, which are called the autographs, mm. no longer exist. Yeah. They don't exist. All we have is copies. And uh, they were copied from originals and they were sent to the various churches. So there were many copies of the original autographs. Now, Martin, if I have a recipe, let me explain this again. If I have a recipe and I sent it to my friend, this is how you do this. This is the original recipe. Mm -hmm. And then that one says, Ooh, this is a wonderful recipe. I'm going to send it to my uncle in Germany. And the uncle in Germany says, you know, my family has emigrated to the United States. I'm going to send this recipe to the United States. And they say, Ooh, I'm going to disseminate it to all my relatives. 
and eventually to friends and neighbors, and eventually there are thousands of copies of the original recipe. Then some faker comes along and says, I'm going to change this recipe. I'm going to change this ingredient for that ingredient for that ingredient, and he sends that out. And then somebody says, but you know what, this is a fake copy. Now, how do we know which one is the real one? Because this one will say, no, this is the real one. Exactly. All you right? Can. So now you compare mm. this new one with this great cloud of witnesses which says the opposite. Mm. Then you can conclude that this one must be a fake. But in the case of Bible translations, they say, well, you know, the oldest one that we can find is this one. But uh, there's only one copy. Now we found two. Oh, we found a little supporting minuscule and majuscule over here and there. And we have about five or six that say this is the real one. But there are 10,000 that say it's not the real one. But because it's older, this one is more reliable. Yes. That's the argument. That is the argument. But it is a very poor mm -hmm. argument. Because it's easy to say that because of all the copying and everything, that kept on being current. Yes. And being older means it weren't distributed. It wasn't. So, and being an older one, it means it wasn't used and distributed so Correct. often. So Martin, if this recipe has been disseminated to the whole world and everybody has the recipe and now there's suddenly a new recipe, that comes out, then some people will say, but you know, this old recipe is tried and proved. And everybody has the same recipe, this is a new recipe, uh, then, you know, this will cause a debate. Mm. Modern Bible versions differ from the received text in so many places that it is impossible to produce a conclusive doctrine from a study of these perversions. Here follows a short summary of the many changes, deletions, and additions which can be found in these versions. Now, Martin, I wrote that down because when I started studying this issue, it became a very overwhelming mm -hmm. study. Now, let me make it quite plain that when I started studying the Bible, I used the NIV as my first Bible. And eventually, that Bible became virtually unusable because it started falling apart, especially in the chapters that I was studying very frequently. And I actually brought, brought my first NIV, and here it is. This is my first NIV Bible, leather-bound, nice little Bible. And it is marked... And if I go to the final chapters where it becomes very important, you can see, Martin, it's frayed and it's fallen apart. And if I shake it, half of it would probably fall out, as you can see. It seems like you've been dabbling a lot in Revelations. Yes, Martin, I don't know why the book had such a fascination for me. Isn't it a closed book? Uh, well, so some people say. And you can see that it's fallen apart. So it became virtually unusable. And I then got another NIV, the same as this one. And it didn't survive the onslaught either. And then eventually I graduated from the NIV to the New King James Version. And then the more I studied, eventually I graduated to the King James Version. Now I had a number of them. And I also used the, the study Bible versions and some with uh, notes of spirit of prophecy. This is now my one which has no notes in it so that I can just read what the Bible says and not have to you know, spend time on what other people say, just, just to mull what God say. I'd like to know what God said. So this is the Bible that I use at the moment. And I have basically graduated from the one to the other to this Bible over here in the English language. Mm. Of course, I also read the Bible in German and in Afrikaans. And Maybe you. that's important because I'd like to come in here and just clarify some things. 
there are people that are very passionate about the King James only. Yes. And I understand because personally, and I'm sure you will agree, like you said, you're now on the King James Version, that's the best English version of the Bible and the true word that you can find. There are, however, some words, not doctrines, words that are not totally correctly translated. You must, un you must understand that it doesn't depend on the translation that you are reading. It depends on the manuscripts that it is tr translated from. Now, some of those words are difficult words. Yes, definitely. And some of the, the words in the ancient documents are such that they're not in common usage anymore because language has changed. So the translators of even the King James Version had some problems with some of the particular words, yeah. especially when it came to the animals. What animal were they referring to in Leviticus? And so there are a number of variations possible. And the King James, for example, uh, didn't always get it absolutely right. They refer, for example, to uh, unicorns. Mm. Now, we know there is no such thing as a unicorn. Yeah. So the modern translations might have a better word and say wild ox. Now, does that make the modern translation a better translation no. if it totally distorts the doctrine? The doctrine? That's what I, what I want to make clear. I did... When I speak and say that the, I mentioned in a previous one that the King James is not infallible, the, what I meant was there are certain words that's translated like that. That's not 100% correct in, uh, in terms, but it's still, the, there's no doctrinal problems in the King James. It's the Word of God. And the reason why I'm saying it's difficult to only say that the King James is the only one because I speak Afrikaans. Now I've got an Afrikaans Bible, actually two. The one is in 1933 50 and 53 translation that was done on the received text. It's called the Overtalen. Which means old translation. The old translation. This is exactly the same as the King James. Maybe with a word or year that's also not Totally and wholly. absolutely correct, and could be translated better. Yes, and this but doctrinally it is sound. It's sound. Then you got the 1983 one that's called the new translation, the Nieuwe Vertalen, and then it gets totally a nightmare. These verses, this is like the same as the NIV almost. Yes, and that be because that Bible is no longer based on the received text but is based on the Westcott and Hort text, which is based on the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus as the prime uh, references, and then, of course, based on how Nestle Arlant put it together and the United Bible Society. And those Bibles that are based on those manuscripts have the support of Roman Catholicism, whereas those that are based on the received text do not have that. Support. You see, and that also makes a difference. You, all the new translations that are translated from those manuscripts, to my mind, n uh, automatically have to be approved by Rome because that's the manuscripts that were approved. Have you got another Bible there? No, I've got, there's another one that just came out, the 2020 direct translation. But from which manuscript was it translated, Martin? It's the same as this one. If you go and see the verses that are left out, the changes that were made in the 1983 new translation, you've got exactly the same problem in the new trans that 2020 one. So the wording might be more modern and the grammar might be slightly different, but it's still based on those manuscripts that were found in waste paper baskets with thousands of changes in them. You see, and the other thing is, we don't understand. Well, I can't read Hebrew or Greek. But at least I know that the, the textus receptus or the received texts are the correct manuscripts. So when I get to the Bible in the English or in the Afrikaans that's translated from them in the old... Uh, but the um, critics will tell you, Martin, that those manuscripts that you are referring to are not the most ancient. The no. most ancient ones are the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. And they also tell you that the received text is a conflated text. Yes. 
Now, why do they say it's a conflated text? Because theirs has been reduced. So, if we wanted to counter that, we would have to say that theirs is a deflated text. That's it. It's the same argument. Mm -hmm. So, what happens there, Martin, is, is as simple as this. The received text has many repetitions. Now, any good teacher, and the greatest teacher that ever lived was Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. And he's the word. Any good teacher will know that if he wants to bring a point across, he has to repeat it in different forms. So repetition is the way in which we learn. Now I know, I was a, a lecturer at university. And when I lectured on a particular subject and I explained and I see the light bulbs going on in the, the minds of the students, but I see this shadowy glazed <laughs> look in some others, then I know some got it, but some didn't. Mm. Right? Any lecturer worth his salt should study his students to see whether his point is coming across. There's nothing worse than a lecturer who stands there in the front and dryly recites his lines irrespective of whether the audience understands or not. It's dreary. You might as well stay at home and read a book. And I can relate why you then why we are actually then doing this once again. Yes. Because we've realized again some people either don't understand or misinterpret what we say. Yes. So the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. So when you see that the students don't understand, you repeat it in another way. And then when you see that some of them understand, but some still don't understand, you repeat it still in another way. And sometimes, if you do not get the point across, you have to change the story into a parable. And make a story that they can relate to and then they will understand. So this is how teaching works. And if you take the Bible as a whole, if you take the Old Testament, the Old Testament uses what we call parallelism, Hebrew parallelism. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Bible says things in one way and then repeats the same thing in another way. That's what a good teacher does. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible is a legal document, as we discussed. And a legal document has to have more than one witness. Yeah. And so you find a lot of repetition. So now these very intellectual people say, we don't need this repetition, we'll take it out. Mm. Because all of this needless repetition makes it a conflated text. Well, removing all of that repetition makes it a deflated text. Mm. And the question is, which one is now right? Now, I find it interesting that when you take out some of these repetitions, you also destroy chiastic structures. Yes. Now, built into the writing, there are these chiastic structures which bring out central points that are important. And if you miss that point, mm. then you've, you've lost the heart of what is being said. And if you, if you go through the book of Revelation yeah. or any one of them... It's like you said, if you don't study Revelations through the chiasm, you'll be studying it in reverse. And you'll get totally confused. No wonder they say these things are closed books. So we've seen some of the changes already. And that's why I want to come back to... I, we, don't we can't read Hebrew or Greek. Before so, you continue... Mm -hmm. The Spirit of Prophecy clearly says that we do not need it. It might be necessary for some, but uh, it will create more confusion in some than it's necessary. And Tyndall said that a plowman can understand more than many of these great learned men by simply taking the word as it stands. And that's true. And that's why I s want to just say that if we want to say that the King James Bible is the only true word of God, then what about people that can't read English? Then Many it's just problems. as good as them that me not being able to read Greek or what's his name? Correct. So that's why in the Afrikaans, in the German, in the Romanian, in every language, God has, like the spirit of prophecy said, preserved his word 
His true word. Now, have you heard me preach in Afrikaans? Yes. Have you heard me preach in German? Yes. All right. And the one now, I which can Bible will I use then? Exactly. Will I use the King James? No. No, I'll use the old Afrikaans version or I'll use the uh, King James version today. In the old days, I might have used the NIV and I might have used the new King James version. But it's like a child that gets a tricycle. And he's overwhelmed with excitement with his tricycle. But once he's outgrown his tricycle and moves to a bicycle, he won't be easily tempted to go back to his tricycle. Yeah. And you know how it became easier for me? Is the more you read the spirit of prophecy. Because the doctrinal issues that she always talks about will coincide with the true word of God. So then when you read any translation and it doesn't co coincide with that, then you know there's something wrong here. Why I say I, I find it difficult to use the new translations today, mm. because you see that I certainly did read the other versions. Yeah, I mean, can I just follow in here? The, sometimes there's sentiment, because your grandmother and your grandfather gave you that translation, a new, a new translation. But keep it. Don't throw it away. But if you want to read the real word. Use it as a reference. Use it as a reference. Now, you know, if you take the very latest one that just came out in the Afrikaans, the 2020, is it? Mm -hmm. Direct translation. The 2020 direct translation. Doesn't it say there in that Bible that the heavenly beings had relations, sexual relations, with humanity, and this is where, you know, these infidels came yeah, from. giants. Right? Now, it's that it's is absolute nonsense, yes. but it stands in it. Just because the language might be modern and exciting, when the content and the doctrine is a load of nonsense, yeah. then can you consider it the Word of God? Unfortunately, you have to say no. It cannot be considered as the Word of ah, God. So when it comes to truth, Thy word is truth. It's not a question of, did I get the translation of this particular animal correct or not? Mm. When it comes to the, what it says, what it says about the doctrine as to what I should believe, if the one says one thing and the other one says another, then there must be two sources. Mm. And one of them can be correct and the other one must be incorrect. Yeah. Right? That is the point. So let's look at a couple of these examples. Martin, I put together a document. Now, let me make it quite plain. I put this document together for myself. As I was studying these things, and as I was uh, discovering them in the Bible, they started to have an impact on me. Mm -hmm. You know, where the King James talks about Jesus Christ as the Son, the New King James will refer to him as the servant, yeah. the servant of God, not the son of God. And eventually, if you read that for the 20th, 30th time, mm -hmm. it starts irritating you. Yeah. And eventually, it starts irritating you so much that you put the book aside and you get the real thing. Yeah. All right, now you have to get used to thee, thine, thou. And we've had a whole lecture on that. And I'll just put it bluntly. It's di more difficult for somebody that's uh, um, first language is not English, but the Holy Spirit helps you when you start studying that. I couldn't read the King James in the, f in the beginning and understand it, but it took time and work with the Holy Spirit and reading the Spirit of Prophecy, and then it gets easier. And the interesting thing about the King James is it's self-explanatory. Because you have Hebrew parallelism. So it says things in one way and you don't understand it, but the very next sentence clarifies it. Yeah. If you remove those repetitions, well, then you're in big trouble. So even when it comes to language, we'll talk about that at a later stage. But let's just look at some of the changes. So this document I put together for myself. It's just a summary and it's written cryptically. It's not for publication. It's not for general use, but we can put it in as a, an appendage so people can look at it. Uh, there might be spelling mistakes in it, and it was just for myself. But I'll make it available, and people can look at it. So if I can clarify, 
This is like when you're studying and you scribble down notes on a piece of paper. You've just put it on a document on the computer. Eventually, I put it together. All right. So, Martin, just so that people can see the enormity of what has actually happened, how many changes there are, how many differences there are between a translation based, a direct translation on the received text, and a dynamic equivalent translation on the Alexandrian manuscripts. Just so that people can see, let's have a look at some of the points in this document. Mm. All right, Martin, as I said, this is just a summary. It's written cryptically, but it'll give you a general view as to what the situation is. So I titled it Bible and Bible Translation, Summary of Changes. And uh, there's a little introduction here, quite a short little introduction. And it talks about the Septuagint, which we've talked about many times. The Septuagint was made for the Alexandrian Library in about 285 BC. The Vulgate, which is the Latin translation, uh, was done in 383 to 405 AD. And the Old Testament was written between 1500 and 400 BC. So we can see that they are separate from what we find over here in the Alexandrian Library and the Vulgate. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament canon was complete in the time of Ezra and then the New Testament, it tells you what the dates were more or less when these particular documents in the New Testament was written. What's interesting, Martin, the Old Testament Apocrypha, those are additional books that Catholicism loves to place in their Bibles. These were always written after the canon was already complete. The same with the New Testament. The New Testament was complete and the apocryphal New Testament writings also appeared much later. So the Apocrypha were declared canonical by the Catholic Church at the Council of Trent, and they said, whoever shall not receive as sacred and canonical all these books and every part of them as they are commonly read in the Catholic Church and are constrained in the old Vulgate Latin edition, or shall knowingly and deliberately despise the aforesaid traditions, let him be accursed. That's the Council of Trent, uh, fourth session. Now the Protestants never included the Apocrypha. Originally, when they started off, they were considering them, and you'll still find old New, uh, King James Version Bibles that have the Apocrypha in them, but they were totally removed once the Protestant world realized what they were all about. And it's, of course, obvious why they shouldn't be included, because if you take, for example, Tobias, which is an apocryphal book, it teaches bewitching art, which is rebuked in Mark, in Acts. It teaches works in uh, Tobias 12, 8 and 9, which is rebuked by Peter. It preaches prayers for the dead, for example, in the book 2 Maccabees, which is rebuked in uh, the Bible. So it contradicts the Bible. And if something contradicts, it cannot have the same source. Correct. It's as simple as that. We don't have to go through them all. And then there's a little study in here as to how God communicated his word, that uh, it was the voice of God in some cases, angels, prophets, dreams, etc. How to read the Bible, uh, the attributes of the Bible, and the study by repetition. Mm. So this is what the Bible tells us, basically. So it's just a short little summary. Let's just look at the New King James, for example, which is you know, touted as one that should be used uh, because it replaces the archaic language, so-called, of the King James. Well, the New King James omits the word Lord 66 times, God 51 times, heaven 50 times, the word repent 44 times, the word blood, which is very important, 23 times, the term New Testament, like the covenant of the New Testament in the, the blood, for example, it totally. The word 
damnation is totally removed. It ignores the textus receptus 1,200 times. It replaces the Hebrew ben chayayim used by the King James Version with the ben Asher Old Testament. And that creates a number of problems. A number of uh, issues that are important are then mentioned in this little section. But just to show the gravity of the situation, if you look at other translations, verses affected in the New American Standard Version, version 909 verses. That's a lot. Yeah. In the Revised Version, 788 verses are affected. In the New World Translation, 767. In the NIV, 695. In the Good News, 614 verses. In the Amplified, 421 verses. In the Old Jehovah's Witness Bible, 120 verses. Now it's interesting. When the Old Jehovah's Witness Bible came out with 120 verses affected, there was a huge outcry. Yeah. Now look at the New Standard Version, New American Standard Version, with 909 verses affected and nobody says a word. Yeah. Does that make any sense, Martin? The NIV removes the word Lord 39 times, Jesus 87 times, Christ 52 times, and 617 words of Jesus are removed. So if Jesus is the word and you live by every, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, it's quite serious if you take 617 words away from Jesus. That's a serious issue, yes. And then I talk a little bit about the Westcott and Hort text and what it's based on, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, these uh, manuscripts that were found in the deserts and in the Vatican Library when the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that they were not the custodians of God's Word. So modern, there were attempts to corrupt God's word even in the times of the apostles. We read it in 2 Corinthians 2.17, for example. Constantine ordered an ecumenical Bible and Eusebius, an Oregon follower, directed the work. Fifty copies were made and the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are probably surviving copies of that. And Eusebius, we know, was an ecumenical bishop. The Vaticanus manuscript was discovered in 1481 in the Vatican Library, and the Sinaiticus was discovered in 1844. And on these two manuscripts, largely depends what is written in the new translations. And just for interest's sake, large portions of the book of Genesis and Revelation are missing. So they rely on a couple of minuscules and majuscules that they found that still have the book of Revelation in it, but they add only those Alexandrian ones and not the great cloud of witnesses that you had as an alternative. So this is all very interesting. Let us just look at a few changes to show the gravity of the situation. If you look at Bible verses removed, Matthew 12, 47, 17, 21, 18, 11, Mark has verses missing, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, James. Let's just take verses taken away in the New Testament alone. And not only taken away, but sometimes left in the text, but taken away in the footnotes. In other words, the footnote will say this was probably not in the original. Mm. right? So they cast doubt upon the word of God. Who is the great one who likes to cast doubt? Did God really say this? Exactly. exactly. Satan. Uh, Satan does that, right. So let's have a look. If you take the NIV, the NASV, the New King James, the Revised Standard Version, the NRSV, the NCV, the LIV, etc., then you will see taken away in the footnotes and taken away in the text, you can see Matthew, a whole lot of verses, Mark, Luke, and the T stands for taken away in the text, the F taken away in the footnotes. It's a comprehensive list. Let me just scroll through it. Luke, Luke, John, Acts. Now, not only do they take away whole verses, they take out portions of verses. So, for example, if you look at the book of Matthew, 
then you have all of these verses, and these are the portions that I've written on the right here that have been omitted. Now, when you make a study of them, you will see that some of these portions are incredibly important. And in fact, in some cases, there are whole chapters written in the spirit of prophecy mm -hmm. on verses that are missing or portions of verses that are missing. So they must be based on the received text, right? That's the thing. So just look at them. Matthew, for example. And this is not a complete list. Matthew. This is just what I noted down as I went through these issues. And, uh, you know, important things like many be called but few are chosen. And look at them. Mark, these are portions of verses that have been omitted. And uh, they're quite extensive. So you can see the problem is large. It's not a small problem. See, it's, uh, that's the thing. See, looking at it like this, it gives you some perspective. So let's look at the book of Romans, for example. Let's take 11 verse 6. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. I mean, important portions, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Timothy. This is just what I wrote down. So, 300 New Testament Bible verses changed in the seven most popular new translations. And here they are. You can look at them. And some of the things that are changed and in which ones they are changed. Now, it's interesting that all of the modern versions don't change the same thing. No. So, you have a smorgasbord. Mm -hmm. Some you have this changed, some you have that changed, some you have this omitted, some you don't. So you say, but you know, it still stands here. Yeah. But very often, the second witness is removed, therefore not making it a legal document anymore. So if you look at the changes, and you can see in Matthew, I mean, it's an extensive list. Go down. Verses removed, verses changed. They are not the same manuscripts anymore. No. Not the same book. You're not so reading you the same book. Can you then still call it the, the complete word of God? Well, if man lives by not by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, then we have a serious problem here with all these words gone, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is one thing to remove verses and to re replace certain sections, but when you change the meaning, then it becomes problematic. Is this uh, a minor change or is this massive? Then here's a list of verses re that removed the name of God or the name of Jesus. If you take Matthew alone, just look at all the Jesuses that have been removed in the various verses. So Why would you want to do that? Who's trying to get rid of Jesus? Obviously, the enemy. Must be. Look at this. In Mark, Son, Son of God, Jesus, forthwith Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, it's incredible. John, look at this. Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. That's substantial, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is amazing. Now, this is very important. List of verses that alter the meaning. Now, once you start dabbling mm. with the meaning, you have a serious problem. That's it. Right? So, for example, uh, if you are angry with your brother, then you are in danger of hellfire. Now, the King James says, if you are angry without a cause, otherwise... Nobody will go to heaven. Mm. It's a very important change. It alters the entire meaning of, this, of the subject. Now, I'm not going to go into details here, but, uh, you know, Jesus is made a liar, for example. Yeah. I'm not going up to this feast, mm. as opposed to I'm not yet going up to the feast. There's a big difference. A big difference. All right? Mark, etc. Now, they'll tell you, Martin, that these differences... Uh, 
don't really matter because you're not a textual scholar. Mm-hmm. Now, Martin, do you have to be a textual scholar to see that two verses say the opposite thing? And that's exactly where the problem is. You have to have logic as well when you study the Bible. If it's not logical, then what's the point, right? You want to, there are certain things that you cannot understand. No, because that, that pertains to God. Yes. That is where you get your faith Correct. brought in. You cannot understand where God comes from. Mm. All that you can understand from his name is that he is. Yes. Now, how do I know that he is? Well, I am, therefore he is. That's it. Right? So I can understand from the things that are made that there must be someone who made them. Mm. There are things that are incomprehensible for the human mind. But when it comes to the plain logic of what is presented, you cannot have crossed purposes. Even with the part that you have to have faith. Yes. Once you've established your faith, then the rest becomes logical to put into that. If God is the supreme creator, then if he said, it crea- it was, you, so you have faith in this, now in Genesis 1, he created all things, then it's easy. It's logic that he created it. Now if you look at all of these changes, let me just go back and show changes that actually alter the meaning. This is very substantial in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, in John, in Acts, in Romans, in Corinthians, in Galatians, in Ephesians, in Timothy, in Hebrews, in James, in Peter, in the book of Revelation. Is this an important issue, Martin? Would you like to have so many changes and have to choose between two meanings in that many verses in the book of Revelation alone? And it applies to the Old Testament because it also depends on exactly what you are relying to when it comes to the Old Testament. So this is a very, very serious issue. The document is by no means complete. There are many books that you can read on the subject. Make up your own mind would be my suggestion. Let's look at a few verses. So here we have a few specific examples of changes in modern Bible translations. If we go to Acts 2 verse 30. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. That's the King James. Let's read it in the NIV. You can immediately see that it's a shorter version. Mm. It's a deflated text. And this one is not a conflated text. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. So this pitiful change is based on the witness of Sinaiticus, Vaticanus and four other manuscripts. Martin, one of his descendants on his throne, couldn't that be anyone? Mm. Huh? Doesn't that refer to Solomon? Yeah. But according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne. Isn't that important? It's a pitiful change. How anybody would want to ride on a tricycle when you have discovered the bicycle makes no sense on, to me whatsoever. If you're going to go to war, By the way, is the Bible a weapon of war? Yeah, it's a sword. It's a sword, the sword of the Spirit. So in modern terms, the King James here would be an intercontinental ballistic missile as opposed to a water pistol over here. Because who are you talking about, one of the descendants? Mm -hmm. I I get hot under the collar, I should calm down. They totally denigrate God. Here's another example, 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Doesn't that verse have power? Mm. NIV, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body. Who's he, Martin? Were you a, did you appear in a body or are you a ghost? 
appeared in the body. Okay. Was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. So the NIV rendition, he appeared in a body, leaves plenty of room for Gnostic Roman Catholic sentiments. In 1 John 4 verse 3, the NIV also leaves out the term in the flesh, as they do in Acts 2.30, again following the lead of Nestle Holland. This is a trend. And Martin, here's another important verse, which addresses righteousness by faith versus righteousness by works. Mm -hmm. Revelation 19, verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. King James Version. The New King James. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Martin, that's Roman Catholic doctrine. Yes, works. The NIV says fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. That's like going from a bicycle to a tricycle to a tricycle with a flat wheel. It's just unbelievable. It, the whole doctrine is changed because righteousness... The Bible is clear. All our righteousness is filthy rags. Yes. So who is the righteousness of the saints? Christ. Christ. So this is a total doctrinal change. And it is a pitiful doctrinal change. And it's based on the Council of Trent. Yeah. If we go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, the King James says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. The New King James changes this to my son. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two went together. Martin, right. this is a totally different doctrine. Now, God needs a lamb to be sacrificed for him. Acts 3.13 in the King James says, the, Lord, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob the God of our fathers has glorified his son, Jesus Christ, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. The New King James changes this to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus. Mm. And the New King James does this over and over and over. Glorified his son, Jesus this is my beloved servant. Did he say that? No. No. This is my beloved son. son, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. These are the changes that make it unpalatable for me mm -hmm. to read these versions. I agree. Although I studied them. Yeah. And uh, I did the same with the Afrikaans Bible. When I saw these things, I went and I made a whole list in the back of my Bible where I compared the Afrikaans versions, the new and the old. And you find the same problem. You find the same problem. Well, let's take a look at the Hebrews 2 verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That's so sublime. The New King James, for indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Or the NIV, it is certainly Abraham's children that he helps. He doesn't help angels. Martin, this is such a travesty. You see, this, put logic to that. It's pathetic. I'm sorry, but it's yeah, pathetic. It Did God, Michael, Jesus Christ, come to the aid of of Gabriel when he was contending with the devil yes, in terms of the information that should be going to Daniel. So it doesn't even make sense to put something like this in there. What about forgiveness, Martin? And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Mm. 
Now, the NIV says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And they leave out verse 26. It's a conflated text, Martin, mm. because in another place, it actually does say that in the NIV, which proves that it is a conflated text, the King James Version. What about repetition? A good teacher uses repetition. Exactly. And if you take out the repetition in the Epinodos, in Revelation chapter 1, mm -hmm. then you have destroyed the whole chiastic structure. Yeah. But they're so clever, they take out, I am the Alpha and Omega, where it is repeated, because obviously it's a conflated text. I wonder how these people think sometimes. So those are just a few examples of the changes that occur. Now, the list that I showed of those that change the meaning is considerable. We've taken one or two or three out of that and said, well, does it say the same thing or does it not say the same thing? Now, we'll be dealing with this in a little bit more detail. Yes, because we cannot put all of this because it's a lot of information again. Yes. We cannot put this all into one lecture. No. So what is very important to me, and I'm sure to you as well, is how do the modern versions affect the doctrine that we as a denomination hold dear? Yes. And if that doctrine is not sustained by the modern versions, then I have to come to the conclusion that either we have the wrong doctrines or we have the wrong manuscripts yes. when they don't support the doctrine, right? Correct. So let us do another one where we will look at the effect on the doctrines that we hold dear. Mm. And I hope that this study will not be seen as a major attack on anyone because it is a sensitive issue and you have a Bible and you've become accustomed to it and you read it. And, you know, I've internalized this NIV to such a great extent because I read a number of them before I graduated to the New King James and then graduated to the King James that uh, it becomes problematic because some of those verses are stuck in my head. Yes, and then sometimes no. you recall those verses and it's actually not even the right one. Correct, and then when I look for a verse, I can't find the wording because I'm actually thinking this one and not that one. So it makes life very complicated. But maybe we can just state it here, we'll probably state it in the next one again, that w once again what we've explained here, we cannot say the King James only. But we can say that the most reliable one in the English language is the King James. Yes. If you want to, you can, of course, read the Geneva Bible, but you will have to struggle with Chaucer's English, which is considerably more complex. And as we said before, if you are struggling with the thee, thine, thou, ye, then just remember that that is the most accurate form. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, I tell you, he says to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. Mm. So he's not addressing Nicodemus because then he would have said thee. Ye is plural. It applies to everyone. So once those nuances become important to you, they open up another dimension yeah. in the Bible. Let us step up to a higher plate. That's it. Let us not be degraded down to this mundane level. God wants to elevate his people, not bring them down to a common denominator. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we may study the word and thank you that we may have confidence that your word is available to us. Help us to study it because thy word is truth and because it teaches us that thy son, Jesus Christ, is the truth, the way, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.